simple study. It won't help us to, um, to solve a problem, which in the end is our interest. And um, of course, most of the students right now in the university, for sure, for sure, have way more skill than me right now. For example, to do sample preparation, you know, polish a steel sample or doing some microscope analysis, or maybe even prepare uh, electronic microscope uh, analysis. And that's good. But eventually in a big company, all that work ends up being a technician's work. An engineer part inside a company is to do interpretation of these data. So do consider our, as engineers, our value within the company is not necessarily related to do, you know, physical work. You will not be hired to, uh, to move, a, I don't know, a box of parts from one place to the other. But actually our value comes in our process knowledge, the pro, the, how to say, the manufacturing process of the parts we are responsible and also of the whole supply chain. So uh, I'm using this image that you have been seeing for the past five minutes. As you can see, maybe this guy, they are checking something in the roof of a cargo van. And why is this important? Uh, I want to be very clear. Uh, in the past, I have faced in my experience what I call desk engineers. We need to avoid being a desk engineer. And that this is related to my next slide. One of the main principles in automotive industry is what uh, Toyota originally started calling the Sangen Shigi or the Trigen principle. What does it mean? We have uh, three Gens, as the name implies. We have Genba, we have Genjits, and we have Gembits. So what does this mean? In order for us to gather proper information and enough information, we need to follow these, step, these steps every time. So as you remember a couple of minutes ago, I told you, don't be a desk engineer. What does that mean? First of all, the first step of the Shangen Shigi is the Gemba. What does that mean? As an engineer, for us to uh, grasp the full information of a process, of a situation, of a problem, my suggestion is go directly to the source. What does that mean? Go to the shop floor. You will never solve a problem if you are, you know, sitting very comfortable in your desk and just reading papers. That's not the way a good engineer gets hold of uh, knowledge of his process within his company. And also do consider a company is not an isolated member of a supply chain. Any company has suppliers and customers. So a good engineer has grasp of whomever goes before him, that would mean his supplier and whomever comes after him or his client. And not only talking about companies, but also his process as a team member. You will eventually know when you are starting to work that all issues are not solved by a single team or by a single you know, office. You will have input data from other people within your company and with other companies. So always uh, do your homework, do Gemba, go directly to the shop floor. Maybe sometimes, especially with the current health situation we are facing worldwide, it's not so easy. And I can understand that. Maybe in your company, you will face restrictions about flying, restrictions, about you know traveling or maybe you are a new hire 
and uh, you need some guidance. Well, use all the tools we have now available. Everybody has a cell phone available with themselves. You can do a conference call with your customer. You can do a conference call or a video chat and you know, try as much as possible to be in the line, in the process and get information always directly from the source. This is critical. And always, of course, you need to take your notes, but please remember, a picture is always better than a thousand words. Now, following the Sangen Shigi, we go to the second gen of the three gen principle, Genjits. It's a way to collect data. How can we do that? Sometimes I have seen uh, in some companies that uh, managers speak to managers and they request information. While this is a first approach, to be honest, as a personal opinion, I think there's always a better way. And what I think it is, if you are already doing the first step, the Gemba, you know that you have to be on the shop floor. A manager has a lot of responsibilities and maybe sometimes he doesn't have a lot of time to know, you know, to learn directly the process that is causing an issue. So who can you ask? Oh, if you go next to the machine, ask the operator. He knows better than anyone in the company what is happening with his product, with his equipment and with his time. And this is critical. Always get the information from the best source. If you want to know about strategies within the company, of course, you don't ask the operator. You ask a manager, you ask maybe a director of the company. That makes sense. But if you're collecting data for an issue in the part itself, ask the operator. That's the critical message. And now we go to the next step, the genbuts. Genbuts of the Sangen Shugi means always get samples, always work on the part itself. Again, this goes with the same idea of don't be a desk engineer. Yes, of course, most of the companies already have, you know, uh, electronic data, 3D drawings, CAD data for a part, but if you don't go directly to the source of the information, you will lose a lot of significant details that can easily help you solve your problem. So if we bring it all together, again, first step, Gemba, go to the place where the action is happening. Genjitsu, understand this process that is, that is potentially making a problem down the line. And Third step, Genbutsu, get samples, get the part itself, understand why is it made the way it's made. Okay, as I mentioned before, we are engineers. We have been taught how to prepare samples, how to do samples, how to analyze samples. And of course, as students, we get a lot of good training from our teachers on how to prepare a sample. That is good. But as I mentioned before, we need to have a wider understanding of all the situation. Because as an engineer, you are not supposed to only, you know, polish a sample, uh, take pictures, and that's it. <laughs> you can try doing that as your work only, but in my opinion, that's a very poor a way of working. All of us have mm, more potential to do something better than that. And what is that? That's what I call skill mapping. Of course, as students, we have a very, very strong foundation in lab tools, and that is good. But also to consider any skill especially technical skill, needs practice. You can think of it as a sword. You need to sharpen the edge every now and then so it stays sharp. 
it's exactly the same with any of our skills. You need to, you know, keep on doing every now and then, either maybe sample preparation or maybe microscope analysis, or I don't know, electrochemical tests if you are into corrosion. There are a lot of lab tools that we are familiar with. The key message here, don't let those skills be forgotten. Always stay sharp, always stay trained. So when the team needs your skill, you can easily raise your hand and say, yeah, I'm prepared. Let's work, especially let's work together. And this brings me to the next point, the teamwork. As a first, uh, as an engineer in your first job, you will start getting to know people within your team. And what's important here is to start making uh, connections and networking to do teamwork. What needs to be done, uh, sorry, I think somebody has his mic microphone open. Okay, so try to never work alone, especially for sure within your team, within your teammates, there's people that can do stuff in a better way. They can do it faster or they have, you know, more experience. So my suggestion would be instead of, you know, keeping everything for yourself, uh, working, working alone, my suggestion would be how about we try to use everybody's expertise and, you know, deliver a better end product. And I'm not meaning a, a something uh, as a tangible product, as a physical product, not necessarily. Uh, the product would, could be a report, the product could be a presentation, a meeting. There are several ways in which we can present uh, this information. Another part that's relevant, research. And I don't mean research as in, you know, doing lab work. Again, most of us have very easy access to the internet, to, you know, library databases. So my question would be, there are free databases on the internet and they are very easy to access. Of course, they are in English. So it goes without saying, you need to dominate that language to develop yourself as an engineer. How many material databases are you familiar with? Also, uh, some universities, I am not sure about on Tirta, but uh, some universities have uh, free access to uh, basic knowledge textbooks in metallurgy or uh, some specific type of material you may not have uh, worked with before. A good engineer, I think, does not need to memorize all the answers. He just needs to know where the answer is, can be found. And that is critical. You don't need to have, you know, this big brain to memorize everything. Just be sure where to find the data. And uh, the last point, all this work is lost if it's not written down. So document, make a report, make a log, what was done, who did what. This is important because when you start again, your uh, engineering experience, your professional experience, you will see that uh, for, for better or worse, the problems tend to repeat themselves. So save time, save effort, have all your work documented. So when the same problem raises its head again, you can just, you know, take a report, check your file and say, well, we have 50% of the road already walked. There's no need to start all over again. And you can give an answer way faster than before. This is very important, especially, uh, I'm going to be honest with all of our audience. 
Uh, when I was first invited to join uh, this series of uh, seminars, I was not familiar at all with the automotive Indonesian industry. So I did my work and it turns out that in Indonesia is mainly dominated by uh, Japanese companies. We're talking Toyota, we're talking Honda. And uh, this was, well, I can say it, very interesting for me. In, in a way, it was also very funny because here in Mexico, the automotive market is also dominated by a Japanese brand. In this case, it's Nissan. Uh, the market share for Nissan here in Mexico sits somewhere around 23%. So when you go on the street, one in every four cars is a Nissan. And I understand that in Indonesia, uh, Toyota has a very strong hold on this. So that makes that only makes sense that uh, a lot of new engineers will be interested in joining a Japanese company. And uh, this is something that I learned while I was at Nissan. Uh, what they call in Japanese horinzo, or job reporting. And that this is critical. Some other management styles, American style, or in some cases, European style, think of this as micromanagement. I respectfully disagree. I think this is a very simple way to avoid, you know, uh, difficult meetings, to keep everybody interested in my activity informed. And uh, the Horenzo has three steps, very similar to the Sangen Shugi or the Trigen principle we were discussing a moment ago. And uh, the first step would be the Hokoku or the reporting step. You need to be able when you are doing a failure analysis to know your status every day. What does this mean? Maybe you sent a sample for a chemical analysis and your boss asks you, when is that result due? And I have noticed in some occasions that uh, some engineers really don't know. They say, well, they will reach me out and that's good, when? What will you receive? So you are, as a owner of this activity, you are supposed to know your status every day. Every day you need to know what's happening with your activity. That's what it's called hokoku. And not also you, you should know your status, but, and this brings me to step number two, you need to do rendaku or informing. You need to update constantly every day, not only to your teams, to your team members, but the people that are directly affected by your activity. Maybe it's not only your team members, maybe it's the team members of, uh, let's say engineering or plant quality or supplier. There, there are several possibilities, but the situation is you need to do informing. If something happens, like we were talking before with example, if we are waiting for a test result and we get it, you need to inform it immediately, always immediately. So if a problem happens, you have time enough to react. And this brings me also to the third step, the sold answer or consulting. What does that mean? Maybe the problem uh, is related to some knowledge that we are not very good with, that we are not familiar with. And then what do we do? Then we do so answer. Of course, within a company, there are a lot of team members and they may have faced the same problems as you have in the past. So it's critical to ask for others experience. Do consulting, reach out to the senior members in your company and you will see that uh, this will help you a lot to uh, solve a problem. Maybe it's already solved in the past. You can do this by doing, you know, short meetings, 15 minute meetings, uh, 
original, the best way I would say is face to face. Again, with the health situation that we are facing worldwide, maybe you can do a uh, short uh, conference call. You can do video chat if you feel up to it. The key point here is that a proposal to solve a problem made from several perspectives is usually better than if you don't do any of these steps and you are seeing it from a single point of view. Two hits, think better than one. Something that happens also in our day-to-day -day life is we face an issue, we face a problem, and it's difficult to, um, you know, to define how to start. We see this monster of a problem is so big that our mind gets tired by just thinking about how to solve it. And uh, again, we can do a very simple approach, uh, what the Japanese call kadaibarashi, or the job breakdown. Instead of thinking about this big monster of a problem, start cutting it into simple steps, very simple steps. And how can I define what a step means? A step for it to, for the Kadai Barashi to work properly, each step needs to be comprised of a single action, which is done by a single person in a specific amount of time. This is critical. Never consider a step to be several actions done by several people. That would be several steps. So. Remember, the idea here is to simplify. And sometimes it's difficult, I know. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, simplify a problem. So what can we do? First of all, we need to describe what the issue is. And the key point here in the description is that try as much as possible to describe it in simple terms, no technical words, no uh, abbreviations, be simple. What is the idea? So anyone that can, that is reading your report can easily understand what do you mean? Simple words, simple English, oh, or the local uh, language you are speaking with, maybe Japanese, maybe it's Indonesian, I don't know. So, well, you have an issue. You are trying to solve an issue. What the problem is? Maybe that, let's let's have a very very silly, very simple idea. You are building a plane, and uh, it's missing a wing. So, what's the difference between our mental image of what the part or what the final product looks like, and the product that we currently have? It's missing a wing, or maybe it has three wings. That's the difference. The, the key question here is what the product is, and you need to compare it with what the product should be. And it's not so easy. You need, you need to uh, exercise this, uh, this skill each and every day. Sometimes the difference is not so simple to spot. Okay, so we have already described the problem and we have seen what is the difference in what the final product is and what the final product should be. Maybe the reason for these differences, you can have in best of cases, which is almost never the case, you can have only a single reason or you can have several of them. The normal case, unfortunately, is that an issue, a problem within a manufacturing process has a lot of root causes. Well, no, rather a lot of reasons for it to be happening. So what should you do? Prioritize. You should need to prioritize this difference. Okay. Maybe uh, we can go and do the Pareto principle. For those that are not familiar to that, the Pareto principle says 80% of the problems, 
come from 20% of the actions, be it a production step, be it the people on the line, be it uh, potentially uh, your raw material. And okay, we have done our breakdown. We have described the issue, seen the differences. We have decided which of the soft problems we want to tackle. Now we need to set up targets. That's what I mean by be smart. It's very easy to set up a target and it's even easier to set a target wrong. That's why I say be smart. Smart means you need to be specific. You need to, again, describe the issue. Your target needs to be measurable. You need a number, a quantity to be measured or compared to the previous status. The target needs to be achievable. You have to be realistic about what you can do in your activity. That's the R, realistic and relevant. You know, don't go solving simple issues. You are tackling something uh, more relevant and also needs to be time-based. An issue that does not have a due date or a deadline is as good as not being solved. Okay. Now we have followed all steps. We have used all of our tools and we have followed the Trigen principle. We have not been a desk engineer. We have not been desk engineers. We have gone to the source of the problem and we have solved it. That's good. So what, have, what needs to be done? And this is very relevant. You have to implement this solution. So as we were talking a moment ago, we had a gap, what the product needed to be and what the product was. So we need to make this mental image and our real result, we need to make it the same or as much as possible uh, to be very similar. So when doing an implementation, you need to verify that this gap was closed. It is very important. If the gap was not closed, that means the problem was not solved. So uh, this is important also. The verification does not mean only, you know, one day activity. You need to follow it up. You need to see if the countermeasures you applied to this problem have worked or not. What I tend to do when I see a problem and uh, within the theme, we develop a solution, you need to follow it up. It could very well be that the solution proposed needs for the operator to do his work or her work in a way different than the way he used before. And uh, it could be a challenge. It's very difficult to, you know, flip the switch quickly when you are doing manual work because you have muscle memory. So my suggestion would be, okay, after you do an implementation, you verify that whatever your countermeasures were, I would do a checkup maybe the day after, maybe a week after, and then every month for maybe, you know, maybe three months, maybe six months, if it's, uh, you know, a very critical issue. That's what you do as verification. Impact, what do I mean by this? So you had a problem in your production process. So if you have uh, reduced this amount of problems, by definition, that means that you have saved the company a few dollars in uh, you know different ways. So 
as I mentioned, you are not a desk engineer. You are supposed to be familiar with uh, costs in your process. I can understand that maybe calculate the full cost of your production process, you know, how much is a spot weld or how much is, uh, is this bolt, how much is this not? It's a bit difficult, I can totally understand it, but you need to, you know, make an effort to understand how to report this impact. Because again, a good engineer just does not say, okay, I have done my uh, microscope analysis and that's my job and that's it. That's, everybody can do that. Be better than that and calculate an impact. So when the management asks, uh, goes with you and asks, okay, what is the result? You can say, I solved the problem. Not only did I solve it, but I also saved the company some money. Maybe you, with the same amount of raw material, you are now able to produce more parts. Maybe the scrap is reduced. There are a lot of ways. And uh, any financial improvement for an automotive company is gold. And a moment ago, we were talking about uh, document each and every activity you have. That's what I mean by stock generate stock. What does that mean? Again, document your activity, generate reports, generate knowledge, and share this knowledge. This is critical. This issue that you have solved may be experienced by other teams. So if you have done the work, you can share this work with other colleagues, and uh, the issue will be solved next time, instead of maybe, let's say, three months, you can solve it in one month. And when it presents itself, because we were saying a moment ago, there is reoccurrence in some situations. Instead of one month, maybe we can solve it in two weeks. And uh, we go back to the previous step, the impact. Instead of having a team of, I don't know, 10 members working for three months, you have two teams working one month. So there's a, a lot of savings there, not considering salary, but also resources. And when you bring it back, again, you generate a lot of savings. So that's what I think in my experience an implementation should look like. Again, verify if what you proposed has indeed solved this uh, gap, calculate the impact and calculate the stock. And of course, in the end, as we were mentioning a moment ago, we were talking about uh, the whole and so the job reporting. You need to inform all the team members and maybe the upper management, maybe the issue was very difficult. So you need to do a follow-up and you do a follow-up, not only with your team members, you need to do a follow-up as, as I was mentioning, you have customers and you have suppliers. Maybe the issue you solved is related to your, well, we can say it, raw materials. And then maybe you can, you know, give suggestions to your suppliers about how to solve a problem that has been happening every now and then with the raw materials. Or you can, you know, turn your head the other way and then solve a problem for your customers. Maybe your part is actually being processed the correct way but something in the next step in the supply chain is uh, causing problems or the expectations are not realistic. That's unfortunately very common. Uh, some uh, customers expect to have uh, zero defects. It can be achieved, of course. You need to consider if this was an agreement from the very beginning or not. In some cases, it's not so easy. So, uh, that's what I mean by follow-up. As you can see, uh, these are very simple steps, I think, I hope, that you can follow. Not only, you know, to solve or to do failure analysis. Failure analysis, as a, if you're a good uh, metallurgical engineer, you can do by yourself. 
most of the people, especially those that have spoken before, have uh, you know fellowships to do research. For sure, they're way way better than me than that. <laughs> For sure, their research skills are way better than mine. But uh, I I have uh, taken the liberty to speak about the how to say a bigger process. Failure analysis is just a step in quality management. And uh, uh, what I try to show to you today is how this result from your activity fits into a greater scheme, into a bigger scheme. So you can understand very easily what is your contribution as a metallurgical engineer within uh, the automotive industry. And uh, with that, uh, I close this participation. My participation for uh, this uh, seminar, I appreciate the uh, opportunity again. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you feel like you have questions, comments, of course, find me LinkedIn. Eventually, we may potentially uh, find ourselves as uh, having a working relationship, a business relationship. So hit me up, I'm always up for a drink. So uh, thanks again for your time. And uh, I understand there may be some questions so I can start answering those questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Luis. Uh, so we have uh, more or less 15 minutes for the question and, and uh, answer. Sure. So for the participant, please, if you want to ask a uh, question to Mr. Luis, just uh, unmute your uh, microphone and ask directly to him. Also, if you are not able to use the microphone, you can use the chat function and I can read them. That's okay too. Uh -huh. That's fine. So, uh, while we are waiting uh, the question from the participants. Yeah, can I have some questions? Okay. Yes. So please, Mr. Daisman. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Daisman. I'm from uh, Universitas Trisakti. I have two questions for Mr. Luis. Uh, thank you for yep. the presentation. So for failure analysis or root cause analysis, uh, can you tell us uh, about the, you know, the techniques uh, like uh, fault tree analysis, fishbone uh, analysis? I mean, maybe you can tell a little uh, beside the, the Japanese philosophy. So, because maybe I, I have done some good cost analysis, maybe you can uh, tell us some. And uh, uh, the second question uh, regarding the software, maybe you can uh, tell us uh, what kind of software that you have used for uh, failure analysis. Just any, just for uh, information, uh, maybe for analysis, like fault tree analysis, do, do you use uh, some kind of software? Or maybe for making like uh, Ishikawa di diagram or uh, uh, the diagram for the, you know, uh, for uh, writing or, okay, just, just any software, maybe, just any software maybe you have used. Thank you. Okay, I understand. Uh, well, uh, regarding software, uh, since Tata is more or less big company, uh, for forming limiting diagrams or FLDs, as you very well mentioned them, uh, there's a in-house uh, software. That means it's a software developed by Tata uh, themselves. So uh, uh, my function, let's say we have a failure analysis uh, regarding uh, stamping, and let's think of a door in a car and maybe some section is uh, breaking during uh, manufacturing. 
we are making doors and suddenly the material breaks or splits or cracks. You know, there are several failure modes and uh, we need to do an analysis. So what I normally do, we do a uh, greeting on the surface. Uh, the grid, uh, the specific grid that Tata uses is different to uh, the ones you may have read about or done yourself in the past. Uh, some people use ellipses, some people use circles. Uh, in Tata's case, we use uh, dots. So it's a dot grid. Uh, we take pictures before stamping and after stamping on the several steps. Uh, maybe you have seen a stamping uh, line. It's not just a single step, it has several steps and uh, this generates a finished part. So uh, the software itself is, uh, as I mentioned, is proprietary. So it's not so easy just to download it. That said, if you're going to run um, a simulation that has material databases, for example, if you use Abacus, uh, we have a material database and we can send you uh, a card for that. And uh, you can easily uh, do that kind of analysis. Uh, your other question was regarding uh, Japanese philosophy or um, company philosophy. And basically what I tried to do was to, you know, share with you just a little bit, a little portion of what the Japanese philosophy is regarding uh, work management, regarding uh, vehicle construction. Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to summarize it in just a few minutes. So uh, if you feel comfortable with it, you can reach out for me. Uh, the, my, my contact uh, data is, the, is previously shared. So we can continue this uh, discussion anytime you want. And thanks for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, I see you're you not. Yes. Yeah, I think we have one question uh, in the chat room. Mm -hmm. Can you read it? Yes, it says uh, from Frida, she says, uh, I have a question. What will the future of electric vehicle battery in electrical cars with? It says Tesla investing in several countries will it affect in all sectors, especially in human resources? Well. I would say so. Uh, as a steel maker, what I can tell you is we can see an important increase in electrical steel usage. Uh, you may or may not know about this, but uh, the steel that is used to build a car is not the same as uh, the one needed to build an electrical motor. Uh, you need uh, silicon and non-grain oriented steel to do that. And also uh, the design philosophy of a car needs to be mm, slightly modified, especially because we don't have this big gas engine in the front of the car. We have a smaller electric engine. And of course the car needs to be as safe or even safer than the ones we currently have. So that means that we need to use new materials. That means we need to use uh, different design philosophies. So uh, I see that electric vehicles will require lighter vehicles. They will require uh, different building techniques. So I see there will be an important shift in uh, what we have right now. And I hope all of us can find a place for uh, to work and contribute to these uh, new technologies. And thanks for your question. So do we have uh, the next question, please? Uh, yes, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't see it in the chat, any other. Uh, do we have another one? Uh, no, we don't have yet. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a few more minutes, so you can ask any questions. Uh, Hello? Uh, 
So maybe you can uh, explain to us because uh, to my knowledge, you are the uh, hello, hello. Uh, employee of the Tata Steel mm -hmm. in Europe. And how this uh, steel company built the good relationship with the, yeah, for example, the automotive company in this case, uh, Isan. Okay. Uh, something that's very common, and when you think about it, it's very logical. Uh, each and every company reaches out to a raw material source that is uh, more or less next to them. If we think uh, the, the company I work with is located in the Netherlands, Europe. So uh, in, the, in the European Union, as you may imagine, the main companies are not uh, Japanese, but are European. So for example, Tata Steel in the Netherlands has a very strong relationship with uh, the Volkswagen Group, for example. Uh, if you go to Asia, when you think about Nissan, uh, they have a very strong relationship with uh, Nippon Steel. Actually, uh, Nippon Steel uh, facility is very close to uh, the Nissan uh, Technical Center, the NTC. And uh, you, you can see very strong collaborations uh, when they are building new models, when they want new types of steel. You can see a very strong collaboration, very strong bonds between both companies. That's one of the reasons uh, Nissan, for example, was a pioneer back in the day in using uh, one gigapascal steel and very high strength steels. Uh, now uh, you see a slight shift using uh, hot stamping materials, which is also mm, a way of reducing uh, vehicle weight. And um, that's it. So we have uh, four minutes yes. for the, uh, the first session. Hello. I think there's somebody the... speaking. Hello. Hello. Oh, yes. Hello. So uh, uh, go ahead. My... Uh, my my voice was uh, can you hear my voice yes i can hear you okay abdul what's okay. your question okay uh, thank you for the opportunities uh, my name abdul topic akbar and uh, i was graduate also from untirta metallurgical engineering and it's very glad to know that you are also from nissan before because i also from nissan company also oh thank really you. Oh yeah, interesting. <laughs> but uh, but nowadays I was working at PT uh, at uh, Hyundai Motor Company. Oh, like that. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, regarding with uh, failure analysis, uh, failure analysis of uh, steel, I want to ask about the Tata Company for the uh, strategies in the future, as we know that uh, vehicle. Uh, nowadays, using the steel or steel sheet is about uh, 60, 100, uh, 60 percent until 70 percent uh, steel used in, in one vehicle like that. Yes, and, that's correct. Yeah. And in the future, as we know, uh, the electric vehicle was the uh, the phenomena that uh, will be happen in the future. And mm -hmm. then, um, as we know that some of material will be changed yes. from steel and, and will be changed to another materials like uh, aluminum or mm -hmm. another. Uh, my question is uh, how Tata face it? How the strategy of Tata to, uh, uh, to face it in the future? Okay. okay. Uh, well, thanks for your question, Abdul. And uh, it's, it's funny to see I have colleagues everywhere in the world. <laughs> So, uh, indeed, uh, you have seen, especially in Nissan, uh, some uh, parts were changed from steel to aluminum uh, doors, uh, maybe the hoods, maybe the roofs of the cars. But 
what I have seen in my experience is that these changes are done on uh, more expensive vehicles. Of course, when you have the money to buy an infinity car, you are uh, expecting uh, high quality, high price, and uh, that's good. But uh, for the rest of us, for the people that cannot afford a luxury car, uh, the intention is, of course, reduce the thickness and increase the strength of the steel. In the past, you may have seen that the doors were maybe 1.5 millimeters uh, thick, and now we have done we have gone half of it instead of 1.5 millimeters for a door. It's only 0.7 millimeters, and the strength is equal or the same. So eventually, you reduce weight. And this is also important for an electric vehicle. You need to optimize the weight of the car. So the engine or the electrical charge, if we think of it as a, as a toy car, lasts more. And of course, that involves less uh, consumption of electricity than you contaminate slightly less by producing said electricity. I hope that helped you. Thank you for your question. So thank you uh, for the question of the participants and also to Mr. Luis Rodrigo Palmera for the great uh, thank you. presentation. Uh, we Thanks are, for the opportunity. Uh, it's already uh, 9 uh, a.m. here in Jakarta, so uh, we are at the end of the first uh, session. And I see uh, we have already uh, uh, Dr. Azizi in the in this uh, Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. So to Mr. Luis Rodrigo Palomera, I would like to thank you for your uh, kindness to join with us uh, today and for the great presentation. And hopefully uh, uh, me, my colleague and the participant here uh, still have uh, uh, get in touch with you in the future. To ask yes, about feel free to do so. About the feel steel, free to do so. Thank you. About the Mexico, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Any question is welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, I hope you uh, stay safe during this uh, COVID-19 yeah. and have a good, I think uh, it's a, uh, I said it's a, it's a good night for you. And, yeah. And Thank you very much. Writing. And have a good so, day to you as well. I, uh, uh -huh. uh, Mr. Luis, if you don't mind, uh, maybe you can send me again this uh, PowerPoint. Sure, so, I can do that. So thank you very much and bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Welcome. So we go. We proceed to the uh, second session. Uh, I see uh, Dr. Azizi. He's already here with us. Yes, yes. Uh, I now uh, setting up the uh, the camera. Sorry. Uh, okay. So maybe I will uh, share with you the information about the last uh, about the last uh, seminar in our department. Uh, I will uh, share with you in the chat room. So maybe next uh, Monday, you can join with us because in the last uh, series, we have uh, two uh, speakers, one from uh, Sweden, we will talk about uh, uh, 
innovation in metals and uh, semiconductor. And the last one is uh, Professor Sir Harry Badesia from uh, Department of Material Science and Metallurgy, University of Cambridge, UK. He will talk about uh, nanostructure steel. So please check the chat room for, uh, for the information. Okay, we go back to Dr. Azi. Hello, Dr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, selamat uh, siang, Pak. Yeah. It's uh, selamat pagi here, Pak. Yeah, yeah, so, selamat uh, pagi. Right. So, uh, it's uh, eight o'clock at your place? Uh, the... Not really now. Uh, I Actually, I uh, wait uh, eight o'clock in the morning in Malaysia time, but um, the Jakarta is seven. <laughs> So actually, it's wrong timing. Now it's ten in Malaysia time. Ah, okay, okay. All right. So, so we actually uh, one hour ahead of uh, Jakarta. One hour ahead. Yeah, yeah. From. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, before we start, I will uh, uh, read the, the short curriculum vitae of. Uh, Dr. Azizi, just wait, uh, I will find your uh, CV. Because uh, the, situ the situation now, it's, uh, we are uh, work from home because this uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, we have uh, also difficult time here in uh, our campus. So maybe I just uh, uh, read the short time of uh, about the information of Mr. Uh, Azizi. Just just wait. So. Uh, for the second uh, session, we will see uh, Professor Associate Muhammad uh, Azizi Matyajid. Uh, he is a uh, director of materials, manufacturing, and industrial engineering uh, at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, I think, at the University Technology Malaysia. And he will deliver a presentation about thermal barrier coating. So please, uh, Dr. Azizi, the time is yours. Did you see uh, my slide? Uh, yes. All right. I see it. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, how about my voice is clear? Yeah, it's clear. All right, okay. I can hear your voice. Okay, um, Assalamualaikum and very uh, good morning. Uh, to all the uh, audience for this uh, webinar series. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Antirta University uh, uh, for giving me opportunity to share my uh, research experiences while I am uh, UTM, University of Technology in Malaysia. Right, this is the uh, area view of the university. Okay, so it's surrounded by the uh, various faculty in the UTM, All right? So what's this? The, I would like to talk a bit about the UTM itself. This is the journey of UTM. So UTM actually already uh, 100 years. Uh, we begin since 1904 and now it's 2020. So we have more than 100 years of journey of UTM, uh, begin from the school, institute, university, research university, and to date. Right, so we have three campuses. 
One is the in Johor Bahru, which is uh, our main campus. We have the uh, campus in, we call uh, Kuala Lumpur campus, KL campus. And then we have another campus, which mean for research uh, in, uh, I think about one hour from Johor Bahru in Pago. So this is basically the UTM. So in UTM, we actually uh, synergize all the faculty. So for example, Faculty of Engineering, uh, we now combine or merge, become one Faculty of Engineering, right? So for Faculty of Engineering, we have uh, six schools. So previously, uh, each school known as the faculty, now it changed to a school, right? So we have school of electrical, mechanical, uh, chemical, uh, biomedical, computing, last but not least, is the civil uh, schools. So this six schools combine much, become one faculty of engineering headed by a dean. Right, so first school of mechanical engineering, these are my schools of mechanical engineering. So this is the area view of the mechanical engineering is surrounded, I can say various uh, area in the UTM. So we have the, um, we call this the uh, lecturer offices, uh, lecture hall, we have laboratory here. We have, uh, this is the administrative uh, buildings. Uh, we have research complex here for mechanicals. In mechanical um, schools, we have seven undergraduate programs. So it's uh, mainly mechanical engineering. Uh, we have mechanical aeronautic. We have mechanical automotive. We have a Bachelor of Engineering, Naval Architecture and Offshore Engineering. And uh, last but not least is uh, under my uh, Okay. It's basically Bachelor of Engineering, Mechanical Manufacturing, Mechanical Industry, and Mechanical Materials. So back to uh, postgraduate. So we also have the same as undergraduate. We have seven Master of Science uh, program. We have the Mechanical Engineering, uh, Aeronautics Engineering, Automotive Material, Advanced Manufacturing, Industry, and then Ship and Offshore Engineering. For the uh, we call research, we have a Master of Philosophy, Mechanical Engineering, we have Marine, and for PhD, we have only one Mechanical Engineering, meaning that if you would like to pursue PhD, you can have in all this area, but the degree uh, awarded is PhD in mechanical engineering. Right, so, okay, uh, now I will talk a bit about uh, my research. I joined UTM since 2002 as the tutor. Uh, I pursued for PhD 2005 in University of Sheffield. Uh, so my research uh, area is basically materials engineering. So, so today I will talk a bit about uh, part of my research, which is a uh, thermal barrier coating. Maybe it is slightly different with the first uh, talk that you uh, listen today, because the one I want to talk is very much specific on the material uh, perspective. Okay, which is uh, related to thermal barrier. Okay, this is basically if you're talking about the engines, uh, thermal barrier coatings. So if you're talking about the thermal barrier coatings, so we actually can see here one of the example is for gas turbine engines. So gas turbine engine basically compressed of three main section. One is we call the compressive uh, section, compressor, and then we have intermediate section, and then we have last bit is basically the combustor section. So typically for intermediate section is around maybe uh, 300 to 500 degrees Celsius. So, and then for the combust 
combust the sections which uh, around 1200 degrees C. Okay, so then, so with this very high temperature at a combustion section, so there is the problem for the material or the metals because metal will experience creep or expansion of the dimension due to the heat, especially, especially if you're talking about the uh, uh, aviation, you're talking about the engine, is work for hours, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours. So therefore, there is a need for each of these. So the main component that run the engine is basically the turbine blade. So this is basically the turbine blades. So which actually uh, they usually make from inconel nickel super alloy. Uh, they make from the uh, titanium alloy depends on the area for the case of combustion area. So the blade made from the mainly from inconel or nickel super alloy. But lately we're talking about the problem to the high temperature applications. We're talking about the oxidation. So therefore, there is a need for the coatings of this blade, for of this blade, there is a need for coatings. So the coating that we actually to increase the temp, the record the performance or the durability of these uh, turbine blades, basically we coat with the ceramic. Okay, this is the area. Okay, this is the one I would mention just now, and then this is basically the evolution. So for the gas turbine, basically previously we used raw alloys. Uh, then they moved to the cast alloys. They go for the directional solidified alloys, which basically to uh, reduce the effect of the creep, as I said just now. And then they moved to single alloys, single crystal alloys. But because of the high temperature, high temperature oxidation problem will occur. So therefore, there is a need for the thermal barrier coating, which is the ceramic coatings. Right, so this is basically, if you look very detailed to one single turbine blade, okay? You can see this uh, turbine blade, and uh, if you observe under a um, uh, microscope, what actually you can see, Okay, this is basically the geometry of the cross-sectional view. This is the substrate, as I said just now. Maybe they made from the uh, nickel superalloy, the substrate, and they have another bond code here. Why the bond code is here? Because you want to deposit the ceramic, Why Z, for example. You see the different color, they, they have different color. This is the ceramic, the light, the bright, and then there's a metallic bond code, and then this is substrate. The bond code, basically, you want to reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion between the ceramic, Y Z, and then the substrate. Because without this bond code, be, uh, because the, the difference between Y Z coefficient of thermal expansion and substrate, they make the dispolation of this uh, Y Z coatings. Right. So this basically is talking about temperature. Okay. So. 1200 degrees Celsius, that can go for the YZ coating. So if you're talking about the metals, the maximum operational temperature for the metals, for example, metal uh, nickel super alloy around 800 to 900 degrees C. But if you have the ceramic coating, it can work up to 1200 degrees C. Then that's basic, it's very simple uh, terminology. If you have the ceramic, so meaning that you can enhance the temperature stability of the component or the part. Right, so uh, this is some kind of summary of the uh, research development in the uh, thermal barrier coating. So we have what? We have functional graded materials, coatings. Okay, so this coating to reduce the residual stresses. Research on the cerium, just now I mentioned yttrium stabilized, YSZ. Now we also can have the stabilizer, not only yttria, we can have the ceria, CEO2, cerium oxide. And then we can also use laser to further modify the surface because 
if you look at this structure, you can see porosity. So porosity of the ceramic. This is a very typical normal uh, phenomenon for the ceramic coating. So you will see the porosity. So what actually you can do, you can remelt things using the laser for the, for the surface to further enhance or to reduce the uh, porosity uh, structures. And you can also replace uh, the zirconia with other ceramic materials. So then this is basically the research. Okay. So then because of the TBC is, for example, we have the normal TBC, they make a record with what is that? Yttria stabilized uh, zirconia. Okay. So because of the evolution of the uh, gas turbine engines, okay, so there is a need of improvements of the ceramic coating. So we know that YSZ or yttria stabilized zirconia is good. It's very good, but they reach a limit. The limit up to 1200 degrees C here. That's why I mentioned show in the figure earlier, their maximum temperature around 1200 degrees C. Above than this, there is a transformation from tetragonal to monoclinic. All right. So phase transformation occur for volume expansion. So uh, what is that is basically transparent. So another good thing for the, uh, the coating in the TBC is basically we can create the thermally grown oxide. But of course, we need to control this oxide. Okay. Right. So what else we have? Many study conduct to reduce the negative effect of the uh, TGO growth. Okay, TGO growth. So meaning that if you have TGO growth, they will um, limit the applications. Okay, if you have too thick, then there is a need you create thin and continuous. I will show later. Right, so the chemical composition of the top coat is altered. You can have other, as I mentioned, you can have the seria coatings, the microstructure changed by modifying top coat architecture. For example, in this research, I use the, uh, another layer on top of the YSZ. Because YSZ has limitation, the temperature until 1200, okay? Right, so we can have the ceramic on it. So this is the current TBC system. What actually we have, we have the metal, we have the, what you call the uh, metallic uh, coatings. Okay, this is the bond coat, we call metallic coating. This is your substrate. And this is the uh, zirconia or YZ. And then if you look at this, in between the bond coat and then the top coat, zirconia, there is a, you can see a, like a line here. This line is basically is we call a thermally grown oxide. It's not, it's not a layer that we could, but it's actually is formed as a result of high temperature oxidation. Okay, what actually the layer form as a result of high temperature oxidation is the alumina. So if this layer is thin, so they are protective. But if this layer is thick, so they become compressive stress, so they lead to spoliation of this ceramic coating. But if this layer, uh, if this TGO layers, uh, grown oxide is not continuous, they also not protective because the, uh, the anything, oxygen uh, can pass through and you also experience of the outward. What's the outwards mean? You have the metal bond coat here. So for example, the metal bond coat here, we use nickel uh, chromium, for example. So nickel and chromium will outward, go up because you have leak here. But if you have continuous, so the outward will, won't happen and then the inward also won't happen. So meaning that this layer is become protective, right? So this is the example I show you, MCRAYLL -L, uh, aluminum yttrium. So this is the common for the bone code. Okay. So this is the typical, what actually we have recent development, they develop this, uh, what you call the, they add a Syria CEO2 uh, on top of the YSZ. So they glaze, as I mentioned earlier, with laser. And they can also have the micro and nano alumina as the third layer. So you can have another layer to reduce, to reduce the like diffusion of oxygen. 
because oxygen from the outer side they will uh, diffuse up to this layer as well the metal so if they diffuse up to the metals so basically the metal become oxide okay so how we do so we actually coat another layer here so what the layer we call the third layer like alumina right so the limitation of course there is a serious, serious negative effect such as a decrease of hardness. Okay, if you're talking about the laser, a good method to reduce the positive but system having low thermal stability if you use the YZ. And then they can now, in my research, I add another layer here, which is uh, uh, alumina layer. This is alumina layer. It's not TGO thermally grown. It's basically a deposit alumina layer. So this can reduce the TGO growth. Right, so oxidation, what's the problem? I mentioned just now, you have problem with oxidation. You have the substrate, nickel super alloy, for example, for gas turbine engine, we had bone put mix from the nickel, chromium, aluminum just now. And then we have another, which is the ceramic coating. Why is that? You can see the ceramic coating, how it looks. It's like a lot of porous structure there, okay? Right, so this is basically the problem. Okay, the penetration of oxygen. If this one, this ceramic is porous, so they can penetrate and then they go to the bone coat and then the bone coat become oxidized. So what actually happened is we create another thermally grown. This is a thermally grown. You can see here, you like a barrier. Okay, this thermally grown is basically the alumina. So which is, it's benefit if you can have the tin, uh, thermally grown here, but if they are thick, so they are very detrimental. So we need to control the growth. How we control the growth? We create another layer here, which is alumina layer or other ceramic layer here. Of course, it's ceramic. Okay, right. What is, okay, this is basically another problem in the uh, ceramic. Okay, so ceramic coating. So you will see this oxide, oxide next to the alumina. This oxide is very detrimental. What's the oxide here is nickel, alumina, chromia, okay, CrO2, nickel oxide, okay, so, or you have a nickel chromium oxide. So this is very detrimental. Where the nickel comes from? So they come from this substrate is this bone coat because this bone coat comprised of nickel chromium nickel will go out if you have this layer continuous so this can prevent the nickel from the bone coat go out and then they create a layer of this uh, we call compressive stress here so meaning how to prevent this so we need to design the architecture here. Either we have the another layer or you seal with the porous structure here with something else. Okay, so this is the problem. Uh, you can see this is the oxygen diffusion, okay, pathway for oxygen diffusion because of the nature of the YZ, this they are very porous. Okay, so this is the problem. If the oxygen go through, Okay, what actually this is the ceramic coating just now. This is basically your bone coat. This is basically a TGO just now. But because of you have the uh, large amount of oxygen diffusion here, you create a lot of what? Spinels, nickel oxide, chromium oxide on, on top of the TGO. So this becomes compressive stress to the layers here. So meaning that during the uh, application of gas turbine engine, for example, it's not stationary, isn't it? So this is vibrating. So meaning that vibrating, then temperature change, we call thermal shock. So meaning that any change of this uh, compressive condition here, they will lead to the spoliation of this uh, ceramic coating. So this is the problem which we need to control. Okay, so this is an example. This is a, uh, test sample, you can see this is a spoliation area as a result of the poor uh, coating. So, right. Right, so we also have the hot corrosion. Okay, if you have the uh, hot corrosion, so this is another issue in the ceramic coating. So, why is that? It's prone to the hot corrosion. So, why we uh, want to have the hot corrosion test here? 
So, because you need to remember, if you're talking about the aviation, aircraft, they fly uh, maybe high altitude. So, moisture, air, they also consist of this uh, corrosion uh, salt, corrosive salt. So, for example, is vanadium pentoxide or uh, sodium sulfate. So, at this high temperature, you're talking about 1200 degrees C for the, uh, what you call the uh, gas turbine, isn't it? So you're talking about this high temperature oxidation. So this ceramic, ceramic from what is that good thing? They will react with this, uh, uh, we call this, uh, we call vanadium salt here. So they will create uh, yttria uh, YVO4, we call it, okay? Yttria vanadium uh, oxide, which is basically detrimental. So we need to prevent this happen. How to prevent? We can have another layer, okay? Another layer on top of this ceramic coating. So this is an example of the YVO4 that we observe under microscope. So this is ceramic. This is the bone coat. There is a YVO4. Here. This basically the sample is already uh, spoiled or removed the ceramic coating, and then we observe under. Uh, XRD to see the uh, we call the details, and that is the SEM images. So we see we confirm that there is a presence of YBO4. Objective of the research is basically to improve the oxidation kinetics in your layer to reduce the CSN formation. It's because as I mentioned, CSN chromium, spinel, nickel oxide is detrimental. Okay, so we need to reduce this. Okay. How to do that? So we have the nano alumina coatings on top of this system. Okay, so this basically what actually we do, we had a bone coat here. This is substrate. This is the bone coat. And then this is basically the ceramic coatings. Okay, the one that I showed earlier. And th this is the another layer that we deposit alumina. So alumina as a third layer can reduce the oxide formation at a TGO layer, or you call the spinel formation. So you can see here, based on the TGO thickness, because as I say, TGO thickness is very crucial. So you need to have thin, thin TGO and continuous, okay? Uh, it's become the barrier, okay? So if you have only, what is that? Only this one, as the ceramic thing. So you can see this, the thickness, they will growth, Thickness, for example, if you uh, we observe on a microscope, we check they can go up to three micron, for example. But if you have two layer or we have bilayer here, you have YZ, at the same time you have alumina, you can reduce, you can see here, they can reduce up to 50%, okay? 50% of the thickness. So it's good to have another layer here to reduce the formation of thick TGO or thick alumina layer which consider the barrier. So that means based on our research here, so we found that that's good, but we actually go further extent. So what actually we do, for example, in this slide, this is the normal alumina. So we call micron uh, size alumina. And then we use a nano alumina powder. What actually we, we obtain, you can see here. This is the last part is basically, this line here is basically we use the nano nickel nano alumina so meaning that if you have the nano structure here so you can further reduce the tgo thickness so that's basically based on our findings so this is basically if you uh, see uh, what actually we can observe if you're talking about spore uh, samples so this uh, normal yz only if you had normal yz alumina and this the if you have nano alumina coating. So what actually we observe, this almost cover the entire surface, meaning that the structure is very much porous, and then the uh, corrosive salt can easily uh, penetrate. So they cover the entire area. But if you have another layer, so at least you can reduce. So you reduce based on our uh, calculation, okay, based on the image analysis around have 25% area is covered by YVO4. But if you have a nano alumina, you can further reduce to only 20% cover. So it's good to have the 
nano alumina as the third layer. So this is the one that we, based on our research, we found that the nano alumina as the third layer is good, can prevent or can reduce the formation of the uh, corrosive salt. Okay, this is basically the mechanism behind. If you have only, what you call, this is the only YZ. You can see they can easily, the corrosive salt just now, as I mentioned, we have the uh, vanadium pentoxide or sodium sulfate. No? Okay, at high temperature, they can diffuse and then they, up, they go to the bone coat and then it will become destructive to the bone coat area here. So, and then if you have the normal alumina, so you can reduce it a bit, no? because you have another barrier layer here, isn't it? So the gray color here. But if this layer we make from the uh, nano size, so that we can further prevent. Why? Because when you deposit coatings of the nanostructure, the nanostructure will preserve. It's not all, they will preserve. Based on our observation, we can see the nanostructure regime main, remain in the coating. So this nanostructure will prevent, will prevent the crosses salt. Okay, go towards the, uh, we call the ceramic, go towards the bone coat, which actually we can reduce the, the what I call the formation of thick TGO layer. Right, however, this, uh, is, this is one of the, uh, uh, our research is good, but it's actually is not stopped there because the issue in TBC is always continuously happen. So for example, the corrosion attack and TGO growth are considered a critical problem for porous lamella texture of APS. So we know that. So if you have APS stand for atmospheric plasma coatings, okay, plasma spray coatings. So that's the normal method widely used in industry. They use a plasma spray, APS, atmospheric plasma spray. But this method, they will provide the porous structure. So therefore, there is the need to seal the open porosity, okay, of ceramic, like uh, why is that just now, isn't it? Which uh, surface modification. So therefore, in our research, we go for the laser gla glazing, but it's not only stop why is that, we create another layer on top of why is that, because as I say earlier, why is that the limit to temperature up to 1,200 above than 1,200 at the continuous or prolonged time, you're talking hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, so the stability of the ceramic, what is that, will reduce. So there is a need for the other ceramic on top of what is that, we could lengthen up zirconet because the temperature stability for LZ is much higher compared to the what is that. So this is basically the idea. This is the normal ABS. If you uh, call this is the APS system, you have powder feed here, you have the uh, we call the plasma here, okay, plasma at very high speed. So they will uh, push, they will push the powder to the substrate. So so when they push here, they basically is become molten. The powder is become molten and then deposit on the substrate. Because of the temperature gradients between these, uh, what we call molten and the substrate, so therefore you will see there is a formation of the porous structure of the ceramic. So two, two issues here. First is limitation of current TBC material, why is that? And then uh, we'll see the uh, transformation volume expansion, failure of TBC. Another issue is the high oxygen diffusion during operational conditions. Right, so growth of TGO formations, okay, uh, oxidation of the bond coat degradation of TBC. This is basically the issue. So we have the current here. So this is the one that I showed earlier. This is quite interesting slide. Reason development, we have all this, okay. Limitations, we, they have each of these, they have their own limitation. For example, nano alumina is good, as I say, they can reduce the TGO growth. You can have a thin but low thermal stability because this is alumina, isn't it? They cannot high temperature. Okay, it's about the temperature of the YZ. Okay, 
Right, so then we create another layer, which is a double ceramic layer. You can see from this figure here, we have YZ, we put LZ, but high thermal stability, because of LZ, they have higher temperature stability compared to YZ, okay? So, but the problem is high porosity. So we need to cater the problem of porosity. Okay, this is the example if we deposit a lantern and zirconet, LZ. You can see here, there are a lot of porous structure here. Lah. Okay, but in terms of the performance, if you're talking about the normal YZ, and then if you have the hybrid, so we call that double ceramic layer, they can uh, enhance the, uh, we call thermal shot life, for example. Here you can see, you can see from the YZ only, and the thermal shot go to up to 160. Same goes if at temperature 1200. You can see if you have the double ceramic layer LZ hybrid, they have much better compared to the what is the alone. But the problem is porosity. Of course, we need to cater this one. So what our research, we have this. Okay, so recent development, we have all this limitation. It's very good, but the problem of porosity, so therefore in the current research, we propose development of laser glazing. Okay, you, you glaze or you modify the surface. So this is the laser glazing. For example, we can see the structure more packed. If you have a more packing structure, more dense, so therefore you can reduce the oxygen diffusion because you seal the surface. Okay, so the objective in this research to modify plasma spray, double ceramic layer, lanthanum zirconate, thermal barrier coating by using laser. Lah. The one that we use here is NDR to evaluate the effect of the uh, glazing. All right, this is the sample, this is the methodology. We have the substrate in Cornell, for example, decay super alloy. We grind, we uh, blasting, and then we clean, drying, and then this is spraying, and then we uh, coat, uh, bone coat, uh, and then we uh, coat, uh, top coat and followed by the laser glazing. All right, so this is our laser. We use NDR laser and we mod control the, we optimize essentially the laser distance and then the laser energy, right? So this is the current uh, in progress. I can say it's still in progress, but it looks like promising. We can see there is a change of the, we call uh, segmented cracks, uh, look like the green uh, formations. Right, so if you change the uh, we call the laser power and then the laser distance, so we can have the optimum condition. So what actually uh, we can conclude in the current uh, research, which is still ongoing, lanthanum zirconet thermal barrier coating will produce by HVUF, K, and APS process for uh, the ceramic coating in order to modify the surface of LZ TBC laser glazing performed by using the laser. The laser glazing process was reduce the surface defect by uh, eliminating or reduce the porosity. And due all this, so we expecting that to increase the hot, uh, hot corrosion, oxygen resistance, and thermocycling uh, is expected. This is the preliminary findings. What actually we got, for example, here, um, the orange here is basically unglazed. You can see the TGO thickness much higher. So you can have uh, maybe around 30% reduce of TGO thickness if you have the glaze. So meaning that there is an effect of laser glazing to the TGO because TGO is very much important, uh, what we call uh, geometrical uh, grown oxide that we need to control to make sure that we have the good ceramic coating deposited. Okay, I would like to thank to my uh, we call, uh, my former student now is the, for Dr. Reza. He worked on the uh, alumina as the third layer. And we have the Azrina here. Uh, she worked on the um, uh, laser glazing. And we have the Nadra here to work on other alternative method than APS, plasma spray. We, she used different approach. And we have Dr. Intan basically work on the, we call the different material of the uh, ceramic coating. So I think uh, with that, uh, I end my presentation and open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Azizi. 
So please, the participants, uh, you can unmute uh, the microphone to ask uh, a question to Dr. Azizi. So, Dr. Azizi, maybe I have one question. Yeah. Uh, do you know about the uh, high entropy materials? Mm, I, I, I did, sorry, sorry. I, I didn't work on that. Uh, uh, but but I, I think one of the uh, one of the application is is in this area, this uh, mm -hmm. thermal barrier. All right. Okay. Uh, you you work on that uh, in the uh, university? Uh, not not uh, in my department, but maybe a few months ago I I have directed uh, the undergraduate student. To oh, that's good to for the explore then. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, in your lab, you do not focus on on this uh, high entropy uh, material for thermal barrier coating. Yeah, we, we didn't go to that extent. We focus more on the what you call. Uh, oxidation effect, lah, which is, uh, I can say, is uh, porosity, how to seal the porosity, how to have the, we call the term, reduce the thermal shock. Uh, but, but it's good uh, if you mention that's the application uh, for this. Uh, and uh, as you said, that uh, between the substrate and the, and the thermal barrier coating, uh, we need uh, a bone coat. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, can you explain to the uh, to us what consideration that we must uh, take into account to choose this uh, bone coat material? Yes. Uh, the bone coat, I say, is very crucial, very important because this bone coat is actually, uh, we can say, it's like an intermediate layer because you have the uh, white substrate here, which is a metal. Metal, basically, because, for example, we have nickel alloys, and then you have a ceramic. Coefficient of thermal expansion, uh, Y, Z, and then the ceramic, the ceramic and the metal is very much different. So we need to put something mm -hmm. to reduce the coefficient difference between the ceramic and the, the metal. So what actually we, uh, it's not uh, normally, but it's net, uh, widely used in industry. We have the metal. So the metal that we could here is basically they have ingredient of the substrate. For example, metal that we could here is nickel, chromium, aluminum, yttrium. So there is a nickel aluminum from the substrate. So meaning that part of it from the substrate. And we have the YZ, which is uh, yttrium, also element present in the bone code, meaning that we can uh, synergize, so like we synergize these two elements. So meaning that this bone code must be in between the substrate coefficient of thermal expansion and the ceramic of thermal expansion because our purpose is to reduce the coefficient of thermal expansion. That, that's my response. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, I have uh, uh, directed some uh, student that uh, uh, did the undergraduate research on these uh, topics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the main problem is the uh, thermal coefficient 
difference between the two layers, for example, the porosity and uh, also this uh, higher temperature mm. of the environment. Uh, you said that uh, in order to close the porosity, you use this, uh, what we call it? Uh, the laser? We have to, um, yeah, uh, actually we, uh, we have two approach. One is basically we have the uh, another layer on top of it, which is we have the more dense layer here, which is we use a nanostructure layer. And another is basically we use the laser. We use the laser to seal. The laser will seal the, the porous structure here. They will seal, like we close the pore. So then we can prevent the diffusion of oxygen. Okay. okay. So but based on current uh, investigation, so we found that yeah. there is a significant effect. So if you look at from this graph, without glazing and with glazing is around 20 or 30 percent reduction of TGO thickness because TGO is very very crucial in TBC. Okay yeah so uh, yeah, uh, I understand because if we if we have a, a thick uh, layers so uh, the possibility to have the porosity uh, is uh, higher than the than the uh, thin layer. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do we have a question from the participant, please? And uh, do you have any publication? Yes, uh, uh, of course. Research? Mm. Actually, uh, all this result is already published. Uh, like I show uh -huh. here, we publish in, I remember, it's applied surface science. And then all this, uh, we have the corrosion science. I think all this already published data, like I can say that. So I can share the, the list of the publication related to the presentation, no problem. So maybe before we, uh, maybe before we finish uh, this uh, session, uh, the morphology of this uh, yttrium vanadium oxide is uh, it's like a, a flower like a yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah quite interesting uh, structure <laughs> uh, uh, do you think it has a rela relation with 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 the negative effect of this uh, oxide to the uh, thermal stability Y yes, this uh, vanadium, uh, yttrium vanadium oxide, YVO4, is detrimental. We don't want this. So it happened as a result of the uh, corrosive salts. When the corrosive salt basically uh, attacking this corrosive salt, you mm -hmm. have the uh, yttrium, uh, what do you call it, vanadium pentoxide, is, and then sodium sulfate is corrosive salt. When this corrosive salt is attack the the, the the ceramic layer at high temperature, so this mm -hmm. uh, vanadium oxide will react with the uh, ceramic. So then you will we will lose the structure of the ceramic. Ceramic, how it looks? Mm -hmm. So it actually looks like the flower like. So this basically as a result of vanadium. Uh, elements, so vanadium pentoxide element, basically we create flower detrimental oxide. We don't want this. That's why in our research, we try to reduce the amount, the possibility that will have, will create the vanadium pentoxide. We can reduce up to 20%, meaning that if you have the 
another layer, for example, non-alumina layer, you can reduce only 20% compared to the just only what is that without uh, another layer you have all over the surface, you will see the salts vanadium pentoxide react with the yttria. So meaning that you lose the structure of yttrium because yttrium already react with the salt. You lose that. So we don't want this happen. So with the another layer. So uh, in the presence of the salt, uh, the yttrium reacted with the vanadium and the impact is the maybe the quantity of the yttrium uh, have decreased uh, on exactly. the uh, thermal barrier layers. Yeah, exactly. You lose the structure. So I'm asking again for the participants. Do we still have a question, please? Before we end this uh, session, I think it's an interesting uh, topic, Dr. Azizi. Uh, for your information that uh, our department have already uh, conducted uh, this uh, online seminar for maybe almost 1920 uh, series. Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, uh, but the participants come from a broad uh, uh, education background, for example, not only material or metallurgical uh, mm -hmm. engineering, they mm -hmm. also come from uh, any uh, uh, background and also not only from Indonesia, uh, we also uh, came from uh, uh, Europe, for example, uh, American, uh, uh, Africa, and uh, etc. Okay, that's good. And uh, think, good uh, initiative. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to see uh, Dr. Azizi today to share with us his uh, uh, research on uh, thermal barrier coating. Uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azizi. Yeah, and thank you. I also you thank mind, you. Mm. Yes. I also would like to thank uh, uh, Antirta because uh, uh, inviting me uh, to share my research uh, yes. uh, experiences. So I think it's good uh, to have more people uh, working in the area especially if you work on the uh, high temperature uh, applications. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, maybe you can send uh, me uh, your uh, PowerPoint by email. And yeah. then- Yeah, uh, definitely no problem. Days, thank you. And in few days, uh, we will send you the e-certificate signed by uh, our rector. Uh, Professor Pata Sulaiman. Thank you. So Are you I also think, welcome to U so, UTM. <laughs> I hope so. One day <laughs> I will come to your place yeah. and uh, discuss yeah. uh, anything. How do, how do you know the Prof Adi? Eh? You worked with him before? Uh, who? Hadi, Hadi, Hadi Noor. Uh, no, uh, actually, I contact. Uh, one of the Indonesian researcher All right. in, okay, okay, okay. in Malaysia, and he All right. recommended uh, uh, Professor Hadi. Okay. And maybe Professor Hadi recommended your name. So yep. I contact you. Yeah, okay. And thank very delighted. Actually, I work also with uh, Professor Hadi in other area, you know, composite. Uh, I work with him as well. Uh, right. So, your uh, research field is uh, ceramic composite, or uh, I, I actually work on the uh, ceramic uh, ceramic composite as well as uh, the one I work with uh, Professor Hati is basically is polymer metric composite, which is for uh, thermal isolation, thermal isolation coatings lah. That's uh, for with uh, Professor Hadi. 
okay so uh before i uh, uh, close this session i would like to thank you once again to uh, the two speakers uh, mr uh, uh, luis i don't know if he is still uh, with us or not and also dr azizi thank you very much and uh, it's a great presentation today and i hope uh, we can see uh, uh, somewhere someday in the future inshallah then so uh, and for the participants uh, we will send you the uh, e certificate and if you want to join with the last series uh, you can uh, check the chat room and you can uh, register Uh, at the Zoom uh, meeting because we have uh, two speakers, one from uh, Sweden and the last one is from uh, uh, University of Cambridge. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, and stay safe. Uh, and I hope uh, I can uh, see you uh, in the future. Thank you very much and bye. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you.